the OPR has been in, um, was founded in 1936 uh, by uh, Frank Notstein and some other people. You know. So it's been around for a long time. Well, it's celebrating our 75th anniversary, as you know. And Frank Notstein, who was the founder of the office, um, introduced the whole theory of the demographic transition. So a lot of the work was a lot of the work was focused on that, and eventually moved to developing countries. But that was a slow process. Then, and Frank then went off to become the director of the population division at the United Nations, and uh, Anthony Cole replaced him as director at OPR. And Ansley brought in uh, a, uh, a much more uh, uh, mathematical, formula, formal uh, approach to demography, as well as having many substantive interests as well. So uh, the, uh, the office became known as a, a sort of uh, center for methodological work in demography. Oh, Ansley really, um, more than any other person, um, sort of to me, exemplifies what a great researcher and teacher um, are, are like. My, my most special memory of the OPR is the second time I fell in love. <laughs> so the first time I fell in love was two years before the event that I'm going to describe, two years before when I met my wife-to-be. Time number one. Time number two was the day that I walked into Ansley Cole's Survey of Population Problems course. From the first day, I just fell in love with the subject. Sam Preston, possibly Cole's most distinguished student, remembers. So while you were doing your readings, Ansley, of course, this is a, a standard story, Ansley would sometimes come wandering by in the late afternoon with some hand-drawn figure to show you. Maybe it was a map of provincial levels of fertility in Russia or a graph of the moments of an age distribution. Whatever it was, he was tremendously excited by it, and you caught the excitement. For many of us, this was really the first time we ever saw research in the making. Lo and behold, my last act as director, of which I'm very proud, is that I was able to name the, the Ansley Cole collection. And he came to that celebration when we, when we named the collection. And even though he was unable to speak at the time, when people spoke, he smiled. Ansley Cole traveled a lot. And I wasn't here at the time, but <laughs> I hear that he brought back a lot of these materials with him when he uh, came back from his travels. And it is one of the oldest and richest demography collections in the world. I think you can say that the OPR was a kernel of innovation. Um, um, it, it created a lot of uh, uh, you know, new techniques that people then took, took, took over and, and developed further. After founding the OPR in 1936, Frank Knopstein served as its director for 17 years. He was replaced by Ansley Cole for another 17 years, and Charles Wester followed for yet another 17 years. Together, they comprise over 50 years of OPR history. What I brought to the, uh, to the office was, which had not been here, uh, was an emphasis on survey research. One of Westhoff's great accomplishments was the Princeton Fertility Study. The Princeton Fertility Study uh, then led to um, uh, the uh, National Fertility Studies, which Norm Ryder, whom I had invited to join, to come to Princeton from Wisconsin. Uh, and uh, so we, we did that for about uh, 10 years, and that led uh, to, and, and, and that kind of research uh, was ultimately uh, taken up and is currently pursued by the federal government in the public health uh, area. As Tom Espenshade puts it, Ryder and Westhoff became to fertility research what Rogers and Hammerstein were to Broadway musicals. An interest in sex was not far off. No account of uh, Princeton OPR research in the 1980s would be complete without some mention of sex. 
OPR used to be known in some circles, uh, just jokingly, uh, by this name. And of course, uh, what we have here is Charlie's saddest curve ever. And Westhoff has not slowed down. Well, we're very lucky that Charlie Westhoff is still active and present. Um, he makes incredible contributions to the community. And I'm currently uh, working on a project looking at, uh, uh, I had done something like this earlier, looking at the uh, influence of watching television or listening to radio on uh, contraceptive behavior in 48 different countries. OPR was a pioneer in the inclusion of women. Irene Teuber became a senior research demographer, a position endowed with tenure in 1962. That was six years before Suzanne Keller would become Princeton's first female tenured professor. Now, one of the things that has changed, uh, I suppose you could say for the better at OPR, although it uh, there are many more women now involved. So I came to the OPR about 30 years ago. I came as OPR's first postdoctoral fellow. And Ansley Cole thought he was doing something very brave and open-minded by hiring a postdoc from Harvard. And now we're much, much broader than we ever were before. We have many, many more people with five signature themes, um, uh, health and well-being, families and uh, um, uh, youth and children. Uh, migration and development, uh, education and stratification, and then still um, uh, data and methods, uh, a strength that we've had for many years. Princeton has become one of the powerhouses in the study of international and internal migration. Immigration research is not the only field that has benefited from collaboration in the dialogue across disciplines. The engagement with, of the faculty at Woodrow Wilson and OPR with policy, uh, that it is a place that has a reputation for being um, both strong in pure academic research, but also very much engaged in national conversations. And that's what we have always done, and that is what we will continue to do with an eye on excellence and a vision for the future. Well, the role that Office of Population Research plays in the field of demography is, is of course, a very prominent one because it's the oldest population center in the world, I think. It was founded uh, in the 1930s, well before uh, uh, demography had established itself as a full-blown discipline. And demographers bring a unique set of methods and a unique way of thinking about population processes and how things, how individual choices and behaviors aggregate at the population level in powerful ways. A demographer would naturally think in terms of, at least in my view, in terms of events and exposure, um, uh, sort of not necessarily the way every social scientist would think about the, the problem. So I, I think it brings a unique perspective. In the 1950s and 60s, the OPR made major breakthroughs in demographic research throughout the world. But the work um, was largely focused on demographic transition, um, contemporary demographic transition, with Dudley Kirk working on Europe and Kingsley Davis on India, uh, Irene Torber on Japan, Frank Lorimer on, on Africa. Um, when Ansley came, he kept up the work in demographic transition, but he went back in time looking at it's historically what happened in Europe. That was a tremendous uh, uh, project uh, trying to understand uh, what led to the decline in, in fertility uh, across Europe. Uh, during Ansley's regime, uh, who, and he taught the regular demography course, graduate demography course, uh, the subject of migration was uh, for him a foreign topic. Douglas Massey, OPR's new director starting in 2011, was once a graduate student at the OPR. At that point, uh, my interests uh, and uh, aspirations in academia were way out of line with uh, what was commonly being pursued at Princeton. I came out of a background where I wanted to study human ecology and migration and ethnicity and stratification. And uh, Princeton in those days specialized in mortality and fertility. Uh, the demographic transition 
uh, stable population theory, indirect estimation. But new questions have emerged about what exactly defines demography. Is this area of higher education part of demography, part of social demography? As I said earlier, it would seem a somewhat alien topic by the standards of demogra what demography was from the perspective of the 1960s or maybe even early 1970s. But if one thinks of demography as what demographers do, which is how people define economics or sociology, then we're all doing demography. Now we have faculty at OPR studying a much broader range of subjects and I study health, focus on reproductive health in particular, and I see my interests in the sociology and culture of reproduction, childbirth, maternity care in the United States as being a, an evolution of the classical de demographic interest in fertility per se. The other thing which I think is, is still remains distinctive about demography are the core analytic methods that we use, an emphasis on life tables, an emphasis on model schedules, an emphasis on stable population theory that help us to think analytically about demographic processes. What's important, I think, is the, um, how the interdiscipline carries forward and how demography is able, because of its interdisciplinarity, add value to the discipline in which it's working. And so here I see that, that, that the new frontiers, that are the kind of work that Noreen does on the interface of bio, biology and demography, the biodemography field, and there Princeton is there, or the importance of child migration and development, human development, and uh, OPR is right there, and the sins of omission in migration research with the uh, relative neglect of, of children of migration, where we're now leading the charge in, in that field. And that's why I've always liked demography, is because they don't argue about the fundamentals, they argue about important things. And the importance of demography goes well beyond the confines of academia. So many of us are interested in studying real-world problems and contributing high-quality research in ways that can be used by policymakers, um, by people outside of academia, um, hopefully in the service of making better policy and informing the public about important social issues. I got into the public health field, biostatistics and epidemiology. When I came here, interestingly enough, nobody was doing health. Health was not even a part of the field of demography. Matt Salganik continues the same tradition of innovation. One of his interests is how to use the web to change the way to do social science. Another one involves complex methods to estimate the size of hard-to-count populations. In HIV, the groups most at risk for the disease are drug injectors, sex workers, and men who have sex with men. And these are groups that are very difficult to study using standard sampling methods. Such studies can affect populations across the world. Africa is quite interesting from a demographic perspective because it's moving so much faster than um, demographic processes in um, Europe, the US. These studies address fundamental questions relevant to theory and policy. I study uh, life course processes, so I'm interested in how health changes across the life course and how social factors like socioeconomic status uh, affect health. Uh, differently at different stages of life. The reason why I think education is key to demographic research is because education is the primary predictor of many of the traditional demographic factors. So for example, education can be used to predict fertility patterns, it can be used to predict health outcomes, uh, mortality uh, rates. Lots of surveys collect clinical information and they tend to be completely deficient in social information. And on the other hand, social science surveys collect very little. What they typically collect is they ask people to report on their own health. But now I would say I have many hats, including a biosocial demographer and a social demographer. My latest project is the project on ethnicity, race in Latin America, also known as PERLA. And it's an analysis, it's a study of r ethnicity uh, in several Latin American countries. And here I am full circle uh, back here and, um, and using those tools and people are recognizing that as demography. I look at the journal demography over the years, it's clearly developed uh, into concern for particular ways of research. The OPR fosters collaboration 
often in the form of research centers interacting with one another. Sarah McLanahan is the founder of the Center for Research on Child Well-Being. So my interests are the family. They're in uh, how families affect child well-being. And at the population level, I'm really interested in how changes in family formation uh, either mitigate or exacerbate inequalities. Christina Paxson, Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School, directs the Center for Health and Well-Being. I started off uh, in graduate school at Columbia working mainly in labor economics. And one of the main reasons I came to Princeton was because of the presence of a number of development economists. In 2000, I founded a center, the Center for Health and Well-Being, which is a Woodrow Wilson School Center that's always had a lot of overlap with the Office of Population Research. And I, I've found it very valuable for my own intellectual growth is that it is a connecting point for economics, sociology, and increasingly other fields. Uh, so, you know, there are people in OPR who've been in ecology and evolutionary biology and now in anthropology. I think, you know, it's a node with growing numbers of people around it who are connected in. The Center for Health and Wellbeing has collaborated with the Center for Research and Child Wellbeing in a number of ways. So one way is through the Fragile Families and, and Child Wellbeing Study, which Sarah started with Irv Garfinkel, an economist, and which has been tracking a birth cohort of children who were born around the year 2000. Woodrow Wilson School really have made this all possible. Uh, I'd say the space is probably a huge piece. Uh, so when we moved to Wallace, uh, we'd already started Fragile Families, so we were able to get enough space so that we, had, we could grow and keep these projects going. And twice a year we put out a journal issue that's devoted to a specific issue around child well-being. It could be education policy, social welfare policy, health policy. And the point of it is to take the very best research on the issue and ask really good researchers to write articles that are more than just review papers. What they're meant to do is to take the best research and package it in a way that is accessible for policymakers and practitioners. When you think about demography, do you think of dry scientific facts? Think again. Demography is also about tradition and culture. Thomas Espenshade teaches survey of population problems, the same course Ansley Cole taught decades ago as part of OPR's doctoral program. And one of the things that I try to do in this course is to help the students become aware of the history of the Office of Population Research. Another picture that I take is one, again, from Charlie's Wall that was taken out on the lawn in front of Five Ivy Lane back in the 1950s. And it's a picture of Ansley Cole and all of the graduate students and postdocs at the time. They're all men. No women were in the graduate program. But the men are all dressed either in suits or white shirts and ties. And this is also part of introducing the students to the Office of Population Research. So the next day, the next time we met for class, after I had passed this picture around from out in front of Ivy Lane, I came into the classroom and I, I noticed something was different. One of the students, one of the guys, had a white shirt and a tie on. And I said to him, have you been to a job interview already? You're only a first year graduate student. And then as soon as I said that, I noticed, I looked around and all the guys had white shirts and ties on. And the women had heels and, and, and pearls and their hair all done and suits on. And I, said, what, what is going on? And they said, we wanted to look like demographers. So it was very touching. In other words, demographers produce valuable knowledge, but they also know how to dress for the part. My greatest memory from OPR is definitely the Lobster Fest because everyone was so excited about moving over to this new building um, and it was just a sense of a kind of excitement that we're growing and that um, we've kind of accomplished what we set out to do from the very beginning. Originally nested at 20 Nassau Street, 
the OPR moved to 5 Ivy Lane in the 1930s and later to 21 Prospect Avenue, a charming building known as the Cannon Club. In 2000, at the threshold of the new century, OPR moved to its current home, Wallace Hall. I was the director during the period where we modernized the OPR by moving from this wonderful, beautiful, quaint, dysfunctional building to this very functional building that allows for a great interaction and subgroups to be uh, included. The, uh, the economists on the third floor, uh, the sociologists on the first floor, the OPR right in the middle with good uh, uh, access to both of them. And I think that has greatly enriched what's happened in the OPR. One of the things that we tried to protect by moving from our Gemeinschaft uh, quarters at the Cannon Club to the Gesellschaft of the Wallace Hall is that we tried to make sure that there were opportunities for interaction. And as director, I started this uh, process of providing funds, social funds for the graduate students to to interact in a way that they would not have done so otherwise. The, the nice thing about the move from the Cannon Club to Wallace Hall is that the roof doesn't leak and the birds don't get in the attic and start fluttering around. What I really liked about Princeton and about OPR is that demography and sociology are really close. Um, a lot of other places, they're in separate buildings, the faculty don't communicate, the students don't know each other that well. Um, and so here I feel integrated into OPR and into the sociology department. So I didn't feel like I had to choose between the two disciplines. It was really nice marriage between the two of them. The other nice thing about it is it's a much more democratic building in the sense that all our offices are exactly the same size. We all look out on the same view. OPR as an institutional setting does an amazing job of just making researchers' lives easier. It makes it easier for us to get our work done. It's the culture, the staff, the resources, but I think just the, the sort of orientation of this organization that's about helping people get their work done um, and helping them uh, move forward with their research. Nancy Canuli has been with the OPR for more than a decade. People get along very well. I think we all work together for a common goal. I mean, every day is different, which is, which is good. And I think everyone here um, really works hard together. And as we get bigger and we grow more, we're just a larger family. The core of really who we are just has always been the same, at least as far as I've been here. I have many, many, many favorite memories uh, about the Office of Population Research. Uh, one of them was just yesterday. The weather was terrible, um, so we ordered in pizza for everyone, and everybody who was in the building um, came out. Um, it, it was a really nice social occasion with everybody sitting out in the hallway, just mingling and talking, having a good time. One metaphor of OPR is the way that it nurtures scholars and nourishes scholars, and I think that one concrete manifestation of that is the way that OPR is always feeding us <laughs> in all sorts of ways. So I would, had a, I lived close, a walking distance to campus, a huge backyard, uh, and we would just pitch a tent and and have a picnic. Uh, it it uh, something it was a tradition that I believe Jane Mencken used to do uh, to house this picnic and. I feel that there's some warmth that's added, as we say in Spanish, un calor humano, that adds value to the, to the sense of community that uh, we have generated over time. I think uh, OPR has always been uh, an accepting culture and a uh, collegial culture. Even though uh, uh, my academic interests are way uh, out in left field for Princeton in the 1970s, uh, I was never ostracized, I was never punished. Uh, the arrival to Princeton was wonderful. I the first meeting in sociology where three uh, Hispanic women were sitting around the table with an enormous amount of hair and big earrings. The OPR was changing in response to what was happening in the discipline and that coincided with uh, the arrival of Alejandro Portes and uh, myself and Patricia Fernandez Kelly uh, and then e later Doug Massey. One thing I've always liked about uh, Princeton demographers is uh, a lot of us know how to have a good time, which isn't exactly uh, uh, a, a quality that's in abundant supply in all academic disciplines. Uh, so I prefer to mi mix business with pleasure, and uh, Princeton's always provided a good venue for that. 
The seminar series is also great. It's very active. They bring in a lot of great speakers. I find OPR to be an incredibly exciting intellectual community to be a part of. Um, it's, uh, the seminar series is something that I've really enjoyed participating in. It's been exciting to bring in experts from across a wide range of fields to um, present and engage with the scholars and students here. An organization as complex as the OPR relies on the skills and support of its staff. As the Associate Director, I do basically everything that has to do with the building, uh, the facilities, maintenance, um, all the posting for employment, hiring, um, coordinating visitors who come for all the faculty. I do all of the financial <coughs> work of the department. We basically work with faculty to find a funder through the Community of Science, and then we work with them to write up the narrative, the summary, the budget. They are so excited about their research and so passionate, which is the great thing about working with them. Uh, we're aware that we're important um, to the environment and to make people um, be able to do the work that they do. And the faculty are really appreciative and let us know all the time that, that we are important. The faculty, staff, and students at OPR seem to really appreciate us very much. They uh, include us in their activities. They thank us. They are very gracious and they um, acknowledge us in their publications. So uh, that all makes the job even more pleasant. What comes to my mind when I think of OPR over the 20, well, not the entire period, but is Wayne, Wayne Appleton. And, you know, it's because Wayne is always calm in the, this mass of everyone running around and upset and up down. It's just like Wayne, you can count on him. And he was that way when I, did my presidential address at PAA. He was there making sure everything was gonna run, which I totally knew it would run. And he's there every day when I lose my plug or when my computer goes down or, it's sort of, or when I forgot to do, set up my thing for my class. So it's sort of Wayne's calmness, I would say, is uh, very special to me. One special memory I think I have of OPR is just recently at uh, the PAA meeting when we had the 75th anniversary party. Um, it was really great to sort of see this whole um, genealogy of demographers um, come together and really realize that a lot of the big players in our field have come through OPR. Um, so that was really nice and to feel part of that tradition was really special. I hope to create memories in the future. Uh, but as for now, you know, I'm, you know it's, it's being affiliated with OPR Princeton is one of those things where you do have to pinch yourself at times because uh, the caliber of the, of, the, of the scholars that are here, it's really amazing. The best memories, I, I think, really uh, have to do with our students. They're terrific. Um, they always have been. Um, they now hold senior positions um, in every population center in the country. I mean, it's, it's been a remarkable group of uh, people but I want them to feel that this is an important place, a special place, and I want them to feel special too. Students are not expected to work on a faculty member's data. They're not expected to work on a faculty member's pet research project. They really come up with their own passionate question, and we get to follow them along as they try to answer that and help them figure out the best way to answer it. Te teaching has also changed a lot over, over these years, and um, I, I think the internet is it, it's, it's a big influence. Uh, I decided very early on that I would put my courses online on the internet, so I have a little website called data.princeton.edu, and, and I put all the courses I teach there. We'll take the time, we'll do one-on-one, -on -one, we'll teach you to write papers, um, we'll almost hold your hand through the process. Princeton cares a lot about teaching, as does everybody at OPR. It's very much a f close family atmosphere. There is so much support mm -hmm. from the faculty. Mm -hmm. With past university president Harold Shapiro, Betsy Armstrong teaches a course on research ethics and scientific integrity. They often come into it dragging their feet because they think it's another required course, another hoop they have to jump through. But what Harold and I have worked really hard to do in that course is to show them that issues of um, how do you manage human subjects if you're using human subjects in your research? How do you manage things like collaboration, data sharing? How do you um, uh, make sure that your research 
holds to the highest standards. So we have a new program, relatively new program in the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson School, which is called the JDP program, Joint Degree Program in Social Policy. And this started off as something that brought together students from politics, economics, psychology, and sociology, all of whom have po uh, policy interests. And they take a sequence of courses, and they do a seminar together. This is being directed currently by Sarah McClanahan and Diva Pager, both OPR faculty. And starting this coming fall, students who come in to, to the PhD program in demography will also join this JDP program. I was a little nervous at the beginning. I've never done formal demography, and the prospect of having doing having to do a general exam at the end of my first year, oh, that was very nerve-wracking. So I remember during our study sessions for the demography general, we would get together every Sunday afternoon, which is not necessarily the most fun thing to do <laughs> on a Sunday afternoon. But there, you know, aside from the incentive of getting together with my peers and really studying hard for this exam, there was also money for food. So that's just incredible to be able to study and have that catered. I don't know where you would get that. One of the things I think I appreciate most about OPR personally is its role in training graduate students. And it's incredibly gratifying and rewarding and exciting to see their trajectories from when they come in as first year students through to the point where they're developing their own dissertation projects. And the kind of training that they get through the OPR sequence is extraordinary. The training in OPR is very difficult. It's very rigorous. Um, but I think that's really great because when you're done, you feel like you're a demographer. Students have always been an invaluable resource. Sarah McClanahan created the Fragile Family Study. The, uh, the students that have worked with us uh, during all these years, just the training that they get, the sociology students who get trained at OPR, they've been, they helped design some of the original questions that went into the questionnaire, they've helped with the data, they've analyzed the data. That's been a huge source, been a huge resource that OPR has provided. And then one of the fantastic graduate students at OPR, Dennis Fian introduced me to actually a problem that we're now working on together having to do with estimating adult mortality. So if I was in a different sociology department, I never would have met Dennis and I never would have been introduced to this important problem. Uh, yeah, I've always worked with lots of uh, students and postdocs and if you look at my uh, curriculum vita, it's uh, most of the papers I've written have been co-authored and most of the books that I've written have been co-authored and they've been co-authored with colleagues that are at my level, like Jorge Durand, uh, uh, postdocs like Nancy Denton was a postdoc of mine, and uh, graduate students like Mary Fisher and, and has been a, uh, an author on several, co-author on several books. Uh, and my papers are almost all written with postdocs and, 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 and graduate students. Yeah. I think that the, the collaboration um, that's encouraged at OPR is essential, particularly, especially for people like me who want to go back out into the policy world and engage with the world. That um, the work I anticipate doing will always be uh, to some degree in teams. Um, and that um, I want the research that I do not to stop at the journal article, um, but to go out into the world and be presented. Many of our students work on topics in health because so many of us work on various aspects of health. Many of them uh, work on families and children particularly because uh, of Sarah McClanahan and the Fragile Families um, uh, data sets. So quite a few uh, focus there. And then we've had um, uh, a small but steady group of people who um, are working on migration and development, and uh, uh, another small but steady stream who work on education. I really enjoy just being in an office in OPR 
and having behind me someone who's working with uh, studying urbanization in the developing world, using uh, satellite data, someone to the left of me who's studying the movement of people using cell phones, um, as well as someone you know on the other side who's working with life tables. It's, uh, it's just been absolutely fascinating to see what the other grad students are doing. We um, plug them into a Princeton network. Um, we give them the tools that they need to go out and create knowledge and to expand uh, demographic understanding of the world today uh, and um, provide them the support that they need to um, begin their careers. And that's about all uh, a good population program can do. Since it was founded, the Office of Population Research has graduated hundreds of scholars from countries as varied as Ethiopia, Nigeria, China, Australia, Japan, Colombia, and of course the United States. Whether in immigration, education, fertility, health, and a growing number of subjects, the OPR has been a pioneer acting on an inspired idea to produce knowledge and inform policy. Its legacy is strong and enduring.